There's a word I want to draw your attention to in this passage of Scripture. In fact, this word comes, it comes to mind in each of the verses. In verse number 1, verse number 2, and verse number 3. It's the term bless. Would you say bless with me on 3? 1, 2, 3. Bless. Say it one more time, please. Bless. Behold, the Bible says, bless ye the Lord in verse number 1. The Bible says in verse number 2, the last three words, bless the Lord. And then in verse Verse number three, the Bible says, the Lord bless thee. Today I would just like to borrow the phrase found in verse number two, the last three words of verse number two, and I want to make it my sermon title this evening, bless the Lord. It is time, my friends, that we bless the Lord and His holy name, that we magnify Him, not just with our words, not just with our actions, but also with our hearts. Please keep Keep in mind, as we come to this passage this evening, the book of Psalms it consists of 150 songs that men like David and Solomon and a few others wrote by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And these words that are found, not just in this psalm, but in all of them, are not just songs that we sing out of the hymnal or that you might listen to on the radio. These are songs, yes, but they are the inspired words of the living God. So it's far more than just a song. Sure, I believe that, that God might, quote, inspire somebody to write a song and to sing it and, and put a melody to it, but not in the same way that God breathed His words uh, through the Holy Spirit onto the pages found in our Bible. But I want you to know that Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134 has been summarized as the miniature Psalter. That is, the book of Psalms has 150 Psalms in there, 150 chapters. But it, the miniature book of Psalms is from Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134. And in these songs of degrees, or songs of ascents, let me just take you back as we've been doing it every week through these several uh, Psalms, that, that these were pilgrimage Psalms that the nation of Israel would, would travel from their area that they lived over to the city of Jerusalem and they would worship God. They would pause for a few moments on their pilgrimage and pull out the scrolls and the scriptures and read these psalms and, and meditate with their family. Meditate with the group that they are with and they would pause and they would move forward and as they went forward they would do the same again and when they would get to the temple as I was in Israel, I, I happened to, to be there at the temple the, the ruins of the temple that is and as I was walking up the steps I just paused at each step, and I got out my Bible, and I read some of these Psalms. Because biblical historians tell us that as these Israelites would walk up the steps to that great temple where they used to worship God in the Old Testament, they would pause, and they would read Psalm 120. They would go up a little ways and they would read Psalm 128. They would go up and they would read each of these psalms and they would finally get to Psalm 134. And in Psalm 134 we find kind of a climax of the songs of the saints. That is these psalms of degrees. And it's a psalm of praise. The life of a believer should declare a song of praise about God. If you walk away with anything, I want you to walk away with that statement. The life of a believer should praise God. Would you come with me as we move through this passage? Psalm 134, verses 1, 2, and 3. As I, I, I've been meditating in these verses, I want, I want to write down and share with you three thoughts that, that God has given to me. But before I give these to you, I want to ask this question. I know you might be sitting there asking, why in the world should I bless the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked this evening. Because I want to take you on an expositional journey through Psalm 134 that's going to share with you why we are called of God and commanded of God and why we need to bless God or worship God and, and lift up our voices and our hearts to Him in praise. Look at the word behold. Earlier in the Psalm of Degrees we found last week that out of all the Psalm of Degrees only two of them begin with the word behold. And this is a, it is a hello, but it's a hello with an explanation point. Saying that, hey, hey guys, 
I got a message to share with you today. And so here the psalmist says, Behold, earlier in Psalm 30, 133, about how it is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. And now in Psalm 134, he says, Behold, I have a message for you this evening. He's writing, Bless ye the Lord. All ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. I wrote down first of all this evening, I have three thoughts. First thought is this. Bless the Lord because He never sleeps. Bless the Lord because He never sleeps. Here in our passage, the Bible talks about these individuals that were standing in the house of the Lord by night. Some would go and they would, they would have watches and they would uh, guard areas of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the territory of Jerusalem. They would guard certain spots and they would, they would be there and they would have their scene where from this time to this, this time, they would be on guard and on duty. Well, as I begin to think about this, I begin to think about how God is always on watch. He never slumbers and He never sleeps. Have you ever tried to research what we need as far as sleep? How many hours of sleep do we need each evening? Well, there is no exact hour for each of us because it does depend on age and it does depend on each of our uh, just conditions of health. But I want to share with you uh, from, from a website uh, off Google. If you want it, I'll give it to you. But if, if you are a newborn to three months old, they say you need 14 to 17 hours of sleep. If you are 4 to 11 months years of age, you need 12 to 15 hours of sleep. Between the ages of 1 and 2, you need 11 to 14 hours of sleep. Between the ages of 3 to 5, you need 10 to 13 hours of sleep. From 6 to 13 years of age, you need, they say, 9 to 11 hours of sleep. From the ages 14 to 17, they say you need 8 to 10 hours of sleep. Young adults from the age of 18 to 25, we are told, need 7 to 9 hours of sleep. Adults from 26 all the way to 65, excuse me, to 64 they say you need seven to nine hours of sleep. And anybody who's older than 65, they say you need about seven to eight hours of sleep. Did you know we spend about a third of our lives sleeping? That is, if you live to be 60 years of age, you spent 30 of those years sleeping. I did. <laughs> Brother Andrews did. I walked under the campus of Howells Anderson College. It was a great experience for me. I went up there and I heard some awesome, just powerful preaching, in your face kind of preaching, which I like to listen to. And anyways, I, I got into a room, in a dorm room, and when they had one of the, the vice president of the school come in and he, and he gave us devotions and he said, your body can function on four hours of sleep and that's all you need to survive. Just sure. If you want to try to survive all four hours of sleep, my, my hat's off to you. But, but you're not going to be functioning that well later in life. It's going to ha cause harmful effects in your brain. You're not going to be able to focus as well. You're not going to be able to produce as well. Anyways, so they would try to, to test it out, how, how little sleep you could get. And, you know, I was involved in some of that stuff. And there was times where I did not get a lot of sleep. And as a result, my body got run down and I got a little sick. Anyways, I share all that to say this. Can you imagine? God does not need sleep. <laughs> the average person spends a third of their life, 33% of their life, sleeping. And you might as well get a good pillow and a good mattress. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, you got to invest where it's, where it's proper. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, uh, so we spend a third of our lives sleeping, they say. But God never sleeps. He doesn't. So I wrote down a few thoughts underneath this thought. Bless the Lord, because He never sleeps. The word bless, it's an interesting word. It means bow down or kneel. It means give thanks, and it means to praise. This one simple word means all of that. And so I wrote down, first of all, bow to the God who never sleeps. 
There has never existed another God that is true, holy, and righteous like the God of the Bible. This God is infinite. He has no beginning and He has no ending. And He is the God that never has to lie down and take a break. He is always on the clock. He is always going and He never sleeps. So it's time, my friends, that we bow down and we worship Him and we exalt Him because He is the God of all gods. The Bible says in the book of Philippians that every knee is going to bow and every knee is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we have two choices on the shelf. We can either do that now in this life, in the here and now, or we can do it then and there in the afterlife when it is eternally too late. Bow the knee to the God who never sleeps. I also wrote down this, give thanks to the God who never sleeps. God is the one who blesses us with the life that we have. He is the one who blesses us with all the things and it's time that we give Him thanks for what He is due. So here, as you think of this term bless, just imagine Solomon there in the temple and he bows his knee and he lifts up his hands to the congregation in worship with all of them there and he's looking up to God and he's worshiping Him and thanking Him and praising Him and blessing His name. That is what this word blessed means. It means to bow the knee. Give thanks. I wonder, why don't we give more thanks to God? Why are we so ungrateful? Why has the American culture influenced the culture of the church to become ungrateful for everything? Whereas... The culture of the church, the body of Christ, should influence the culture of the world to become more thankful. Perhaps the reason why most people aren't as grateful is because God is not the priority of their life. Bow to Him who never sleeps. Give thanks to the God that never sleeps. I also wrote on this, give praise to the God who never sleeps. My dear friends, as we look at verse number 1, Behold, I have a message. Behold, the psalmist says, Bless His name, bow to Him, give thanks and praise His holy name. Those at night, those during the day, when you rise, when you go to bed, throughout the day, let's live a lifestyle of bowing our hearts to Him. Bless the Lord because He never sleeps. Also, as I read verse number 2, I like verse number 2. It says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. How we're done secondly. Bless the Lord because our worship never silences. Bless the Lord because our worship never silences. We have a choice in our lives. We can either choose, as a Christian, we can either choose to worship God or we can literally choose to worship ourselves. Here, it says in verse number 2, lift up your hands, which, by the way, in the Hebrew, that surely means David or whoever wrote this psalm wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Lift up your hands. It's okay for you to lift up your hands when you worship God. You know, we were talking about some of the legalist churches out there these days and Sure, they're going to be out there. But I'm here to tell you something. If somebody calls you down because you lifted up your hand to worship God, if somebody says you can't do that, you need to look at them and say, hey, maybe you're not worshiping the same God I am. Because the Bible says in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that they lifted up their hands to worship God. And it's okay. Lift up your hands. I know it's a Baptist church. I know we're a little conservative. But it's okay, my friends, if we lift up our hands in the sanctuary. You know what the word sanctuary means? It literally means a sacred, sanctified place. I realize that, that there is nothing sacred about the wood that's on the ground. And I surely know there's not a whole lot sacred about those pews. <laughs> Some of them are falling apart. Uh, I know there's nothing sacred about the carpet here, or the brick, the paint, the ceiling tiles, the, the chandeliers. Maybe the fans, though. I mean, there might be something special about those fans keeping us cool. There's nothing special about this stuff. This is just a building like any other building. But the reason why people call it a sanctuary is because it's a place that we've set aside to dedicate our time to worship God. Bless the Lord because our worship never silences. Check it out now. As I read this, I wrote down this. Uh, worship God 
in the sanctuary of your heart. Worship God in the sanctuary of your heart. It begins inside. And then it's manifested on the outside. Listen, this psalm, it's not about, hey, should we sing Chris Tomlin, How Great Is Our God? Or should we sing Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee? This psalm is not about that. This psalm is about lifting up your hands in the sanctuary and blessing His name. And by the way, well, I'll get to that a little later. But worship God in the sanctuary of your heart. I wonder this evening, or I wonder when we assemble ourselves together here at our church, are we worshiping God with the heart? Or are we just going through the ritualistic motions of listening to the sermon? Maybe jotting down a thing or two? Or standing up, opening up the hymnal and just, you know, kind of singing the song? You know, I've been in all styles of worship services. And people say that, man, traditional churches are just as dead as a doorknob. And they say that, that modern churches are just alive and well. You know, Whenever I go out and speak, I do have the opportunity to sit on the platform and look out in the congregation. And I'm here to tell you something. It doesn't matter what style of worship it is. Most churches are dead as a doorknob. Bow the knee, the Bible says over here. Bless His name. Lift up your hearts and hands in the sanctuary and bless His name. I want to share this with you. Not only worship God in the sanctuary of your heart, but worship God in the sanctuary of the church. Worship God in the sanctuary of the church. So it all begins with our heart, our motive. When we come and, and if our hearts are not right, then it disrupts the worship between, the vertical worship between us and God. But here, as we look at this verse, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Yes, it begins in the heart, but then it's going to... We have a corporate worship service like this. And I realize that, hey, you can worship God in your car driving down the road just like you can worship God here. But the Bible says in the New Testament not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. Why should we not do that? Well, because the Bible talks about edifying one another and keeping each other accountable in the Lord and our faith. So that we can say, hey, hey, brother, hey, sister, how's your walk with God today? How's your Bible reading going? How's your prayer life? How's all that going? But anyways, worship God in the sanctuary of your heart, but I also wrote down worship God in the sanctuary of the church. The first time I was exposed to Chris Tomlin's How Great Is Our God, I was at a Choir of the Fire con uh, 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 youth conference in North Carolina with a guy named Ron Luce. I remember him because he was up there preaching. I don't remember what he talked about, but it was a moving message. And I, I was so moved by it, I just said, I'm going to buy his book. So I went and bought his book. Only really because of all the statistics that were in there that he was sharing. He said it was in his book, so I went there. But anyways, as we were there, um, we were listening to all these songs. And listen, for the most part, it, was just, it, was just, it wasn't a great experience until they started singing, How Great Is Our God. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been into a modern worship service, but when sometimes people get into it, they're like, ah, really into it. <laughs> and it's almost like when you look at them, they're like almost as if they're constipated. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyways, I, we, we were kind of making fun of all these people while we were there as teenagers. And then they pull out this song, How Great Is Our God. And the next thing I know, I'm like, oh, how great is our God? <laughs> anyways, that was my first experience with it. It was a, kind of a cool experience at some points. But worship God in the sanctuary of the church. Hey, it's not about style. It's about the heart. And it's time, my friends, that we... Worship God here, but also within our own hearts. I also wrote down this. Worship God in the sanctuary of your life. You see, if, if our hearts are right with God, then our worship, our corporate worship is going gonna, gonna to be great. But then our lifestyles are going to be holy. I wrote down this statement I wanted to share with you. Worship God in the sanctuary because He died on Calvary. You see, he went to Calvary's cross so that he could be exalted, lifted up. And, and in John, the book of John, where it says that, that and I, even I, be lifted up. You know, it's referring, to, it's referring to Jesus dying on the cross. And he was lifted up on the cross. And now all men can come to know him as Savior. And now it's our responsibility to worship him because there is no God out there like Jesus Christ who would die and pay for our sins on Calvary like he did. Amen. And here in our psalm this evening, the final psalm of a sense... We are reminded of the urgency and importance of blessing the Lord. 
and worshiping Him. In verse number 1, I wrote down, Bless the Lord because He never sleeps. In verse number 2, I wrote down, Bless the Lord because our worship never silences. Even though we might have a disruptive worship at times between God, our worship never silences. And, and what I mean by that is we're either going to worship the Savior or we're going to spend time worshiping ourselves. And it's a far more important to worship God. But as I read verse 3, I want to share with you thirdly and finally this evening, Bless the Lord because our blessings never stop. Bless the Lord, because our blessings never stop. Look at verse number 3. It says, the Lord, remember in the Old Testament, in verse number 1, the Lord's mentioned three times. In verse number 2, it's mentioned one time. And in verse number 3, it's mentioned once. So, so you do the math. That is five times here in this, these three verses. Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, referring to Jehovah God. And it says, the Lord, Jehovah God, that made heaven and earth... And now, let's pause for just a second. I wrote down this. God has blessed me with life in the creation. As I read this little phrase, the Lord that made heaven and earth, the Lord God Jehovah made it all. Despite what the evolutionists say, despite what the atheists claim, despite what all the agnostics they say, oh, I just don't know who did it, but it looks like somebody did it. Despite what, what Islam says, or what Buddhism says, or any other crazy belief system says, God Jehovah created this world. Amen. And in the New Testament, you know what I find interesting? It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And the one it's talking about is Jesus Christ. As we looked in Colossians in chapter 1, it talks about how of Him all things consist. He is the one that created everything. And I'm here to tell you something. God is the Creator. Whether Hollywood wants to admit it or not. Whether my biology teacher back in 10th grade and 12th grade wanted to admit that God is a creator, hey, God is. Whether, whether the, the, the individuals teaching at Virginia Tech or University of Virginia or any other university out there for that matter, saying that there is no God, well, they're wrong and did wrong. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I know I'm preaching to the choir about this, but, but I'm passionate about creation. Because it was through a creation scientist that God got a hold of my heart and ministered to me. And perhaps the reason why a lot of people have shipwrecked faith, especially the millennial generation, my generation, and younger, is because they are not taught biblical creationism. And how God created this world about six to 10,000 years ago, and He did it in six literal days, and He rests on the seventh. And then about 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood. And that what we see today, the big mountains and the deep valleys and, and, and some of the other things, is a direct result of a worldwide flood. And Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and hallelujah, we praise His name, He is coming again. <laughs> we, can, we can kind of debate about the exact timing of His return, but, but nonetheless, He's coming again. And the rapture will take place, and He will plant His foot on the Mount of Olives. Amen. The Lord that made heaven and earth. Bless thee out of Zion. God has blessed me and you with life in creation. But I also wrote down this. God has blessed me with eternal salvation. <clears throat> Never go far away from the time that you came to know Christ as Savior. Keep it fresh. Remember what David said when he sinned against God? And committed adultery with Bathsheba. He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Perhaps the reason why a lot of people backslide and drift away from God is because they don't keep their salvation experience and the time they became born again as a focus and as a memory on a daily basis. Has God saved you? Are you, as the preacher said, heaven bound with the hammer down? I once heard a preacher say, an education without salvation is damnation. And the Bible tells us that apart from Jesus Christ, there is no other way to heaven. Neither is there salvation any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
The Bible says that all those who reject Christ as Savior will spend eternity in a horrible place called hell. And God doesn't want them to go there. God has blessed me with life and creation. God has blessed me with eternal salvation. And you know what God has blessed us with? God has blessed me and you and everybody else out there who calls themselves believers and followers of Christ. God has blessed me with His great commission. Look, it says, The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. As I read this verse, I couldn't help but think in, in Romans chapter 1, it talks about how the, the creation is a manifestation of the Creator. It reveals Him. And then He has put the law in our hearts, called a conscience. And we know right from wrong. And then God has revealed Himself to us through Jesus Christ from Zion. That is the, the place called the Holy Land. Jesus came and He died there. And as He ascended up into heaven, right before doing that, He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Have you ever wondered why we don't take the Great Commission as seriously as we ought to? I mean, just think about it now. Let's think about this. Eternity lasts forever. It has no beginning. It has no ending. We spend a life. You know, we have a date of birth. And we have a date of death. You go to any cemetery out there, you see those dates. You see that dash in between. That dash is what represents somebody's life. How are you going to live your dash? I wasn't planning on doing this. But I was at a funeral on Monday. And I read a poem that was written back in the 90s. And I want to read it to you. Because this poem, I'm telling you, when I first heard it, I'm going to tell you something. The first time I experienced death as a sixth grader, it changed me. It made me think soberly. I got out of high school, started working with my uncle at a funeral home. First time seeing a, a deceased body in a casket was sobering. As a 21-year-old preaching my first sermon, I had no idea what to say. If it wasn't for Pastor English, God only knows what I would have said. But that was a sobering experience. And now, literally, Dozens of funerals I spoke at. And every time, God reveals to me that the most important thing we can do with our dash is tell others about Christ. Look, listen. Linda Ellis wrote these words in 1996. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So, think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, will you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? We have a ride for ages of age here this evening. 
from children all the way to senior citizen. And it's never too late to spend your life in complete dedication to sharing the good news of Jesus' death, His burial, and His resurrection. My dear friends, it's time that we bless the Lord because we have the great privilege of telling others about Him. We have the great privilege of worshiping Him from our hearts all the way to our lives. Will you live a lifestyle of worship to Him? Father, we thank You so much for Your Word.